so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman. You're listening to No Filter. And if I told you you were about to hear from a sociopath, what kind of person would you picture? Maybe a serial killer? Someone evil? A criminal who'd spent time in jail? Or a person who took pleasure from inflicting pain on people or maybe hurting animals? Well, you're about to meet Patrick Gagney. Patrick is short for Patricia. She's a 48-year-old woman who is a sociopath. But I've never met anyone who looks less like how I imagined a sociopath would look or act. And preparing for this interview was really weird because usually I think very carefully about how I can make sure my guests feel super comfortable because I don't want them to feel nervous. I want them to trust me. For a good interview, they have to trust me. And I don't ever want my questions to feel intrusive or like I'm judging them. But when you're a sociopath, like Patrick is, none of those emotions are relevant. And it's not that she's got no emotions. She does. And she's going to explain that in a moment. But this is an interview unlike any I've ever done. And I honestly did not want it to end. We ended up speaking for like 90 minutes. Patrick Gagney is a writer. Her memoir is called Sociopath, and it is absolutely mesmerizing. She is a former therapist, and she's also an advocate for people suffering from sociopath, psychopathic, and anti personality disorders. As you can imagine, I had a lot of questions about what it's like being a sociopath. Can Patrick love? Does she get sad? Does she get scared? Can she feel guilt or shame? Well, spoiler alert, no to the guilt or the shame. She just doesn't experience them and that can have a big impact on her behaviour. Also, I wanted to know what friendship looked like for her. Can she be trusted? And what were the sociopath signs that popped up when she was a child? How did she know that she was a sociopath? Sociopaths tend to lie and break laws and act impulsively. They have little regard for their own safety or the safety of others because they simply don't have fear. Patrick is married and she has two children, but her relationships are not the same as neurotypical ones. And in this interview, she's very open about it. It's believed just under 5% of the population are sociopaths. That is one in 25 people. So it's highly likely that you already know someone who is a sociopath, or maybe you are one. And that's why Patrick wrote the book, because it's actually really not all that bad being a sociopath. Here's Patrick Gagney. I learned from your book that there are eight basic human emotions, the fundamental emotions. They're the inherent emotions that everybody is born with. And it's anger, anticipation, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, and disgust. Those are the core inherent emotions. I understand that more have been added, but when I was doing my research and I came across that emotional color wheel that identifies those primary emotions, those are the eight that were identified. Anger, anticipation, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, and disgust. The ones that I didn't really understand were trust and anticipation. I wouldn't have thought that they were emotions. I think it's just reactions that we are not taught. So when you are a child, you are not born with an inherent ability to empathize with other children. That's Mm -hmm. something that you learn through modeling, socialization. Whereas anticipation, I think that that's not something that you're taught. That's something that happens very naturally Mm. for everyone. You know, you talk about your childhood, obviously the book starts there, and there's a good parallel to be drawn between you and your sister, both for the reader and for you who was living it. Your sister Harlow was four years younger than you. I wanted to ask about some of the points at which you noticed that the way you were was different to her or different to other kids your age, starting with maybe the sleepover. I don't remember having an aha moment necessarily with my sister. It was just an understanding, oh, she experiences feelings. She experiences things differently than I do. Having a sister 
who was progressing through quote unquote normal complex emotional development really illustrated for me just how neurotypical I was, but I didn't really perceive it as right, wrong, bad, or good, just different. It wasn't until I started interacting with other kids at school and I saw, oh, this is something that I need to figure out. And if I can't figure out how to feel the way they do, then I need to fake it. When you left the sleepover and decided that you were going to walk home, I think you were seven years old, a neurotypical child would feel nervous, knowing they were doing something wrong, scared because they were out in the dark, worried that they were going to get kidnapped or murdered. How did you feel? I felt liberated. I don't think I would have used that term then, but looking back, that's how I would describe that feeling. Because at the time, I don't imagine I would have really understood this then as well, but I understood that there was something different about me from a very early age. And almost immediately after making that you know, sort of observation, I also understood that kids like me were not seen favorably. Kids that said they don't really feel remorse, they don't feel shame. I remember having those conversations with adults and seeing their faces and and understanding very quickly that I needed to hide the way that I felt or didn't feel. So when I left that party and I was walking around, I remember feeling like, oh, I don't have to hide. I don't have to pretend I'm just out here in this great big world all by myself. And I liked the way that felt that I could just look through people's windows and sort of investigate these different lives without being expected to emote or react or have an appropriate experience. I was just having my own experience. I asked you about the range of human emotions, the emotions we're born with. As a sociopath, which do you have access to? The ones that everyone is born with, I have access to those. Everyone does, including psychopaths. Everyone is born with these inherent emotions. It's the learned emotions that people who are psychopathic and sociopathic and to some extent who have antisocial personality disorders, those are the ones that we struggle with. So I always hear, oh, sociopaths can't feel, psychopaths can't feel. No, no, we can feel. The emotions that we struggle with are the learned emotions, empathy, love, shame, guilt, remorse. These are taught and these are learned through the socialization process. I can experience those emotions. It just took me a little bit longer to access them. Now, that is different from psychopathy. The big question that I get asked frequently is what is the difference between psychopathy and sociopathy? And it's a very important question. It's a tricky one because they've recently renamed sociopathy as secondary psychopathy. Which is incredibly unhelpful for sociopaths. Well, it's also unhelpful research-wise because when you go to look up the research, am I reading about sociopathy, psychopathy, what's the difference? But if you're looking at it through that lens, the classic primary psychopath has brain abnormalities that we believe make it impossible for them to move through complex emotional development. So while they're going to have those primary emotions that we discussed, they're not able to learn the so-called learned emotions, period. That is different from sociopathy. We can learn the social emotions. We just learn them differently. In the book, I refer to this as an emotional learning disability because that's really what it felt like. I remember seeing a kid in my class struggling to read, and I remember listening to the tutor kind of give him tips on how to learn it, and they were different than the tips that I had been taught when I was taught to read. And I remember thinking, I wonder if there is someone that could give me tips on how to understand these other emotions that I see all these other kids experience. Mm. And the long and short of it is there are other tips. And as I got older, and as I sort of learned more about my personality type, started to understand the nuance of, you know, the sociopathic personality. I did, you know, find an approach to those social emotions. It's not as easy for me as it is for someone who is neurotypical, but I have found that over time, I've been able to grasp the core concepts of a lot of them. It's interesting hearing you describe that. There'll be people listening to this that will think, well, some of what you say sounds similar to autism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you ever considered? How is it different? It's different because the motivation is different. I concede that there are certain behavioral characteristics 
that might present as similar, but members of the autism spectrum community have worked really, really hard to earn not just respect for their disorder, but greater understanding. So I really want to be careful. I would never conflate the two, but I can see how if you are looking at someone who seems to have a hard time emoting, seems to have a hard time accessing social emotions, I can see how someone with autism might think, oh, this is similar. The difference is someone who is on the autistic spectrum will not typically intentionally manipulate, intentionally lie, intentionally harm. Whereas someone who is sociopathic, well, for me, I remember learning very early that I needed to hide and deny and manipulate so that people didn't find out that I didn't experience these emotions. Hmm. That was a coping mechanism that turned into a a lifestyle strategy. That's not going to be a path that someone on the autism spectrum, they're not going to choose a path of deceit or manipulation or cunning the way that someone who is sociopathic. Hmm. How did your mum react when you arrived home that night? She was scared. And certainly looking back, I understand why she was scared. As a kid, I remember I had a cognitive understanding of why she was scared, but I couldn't relate to it emotionally because in my head, I was thinking, I just walked home and I didn't want to call you. That would have meant involving other people. And I just walked home. Can we just forget about it? Can we forget about it? But I also understood we weren't just going to forget about it. It was a big deal. I knew that it was a big deal, even though I couldn't connect with it emotionally. I understood cognitively that's probably not something I should do again. Did you ever feel fear as a child? Yes, but not in the way that other kids seem to feel it. So I do experience fear. It's not tethered to things like fear of judgment, fear of other people's disappointments, fear of other people's expectations. I certainly have a high fear threshold. My husband likes to joke that if I were to see a clown descending into a basement, I'd follow the clown into the basement just because I was so curious to see what (laughs) the clown's basement looks like. And he's very, it's true. (laughs) I typically don't register, oh, this was a bad idea until after the fact. Which played out one time when you were playing in your front garden with your sister and a man came along. How did that situation play out differently between you and your sister? A man showed up and said that he had kittens. And my sister understood right away that this was not someone to be trusted, that this was not someone to be underestimated. And she was younger than I was. And all I could think about was, he's giving away kittens. Like, of course, we're going to follow him. Like, that's crazy. Like, we should go get one of these kittens. And I followed him down the street. And it wasn't until I was almost to his car that I realized oh, he doesn't have kittens. And this is one big ploy. And I have been foolish in following this person. But what got me into danger is what I also believe ultimately saved me in that when I recognized that, I didn't react overtly. I distracted him. I charmed him. I I smiled and I started asking him about the kittens and about his wife. He said he'd had a wife. And I waited until he was sort of distracted answering my questions. And then I, I took off running, but my sister got it right away. She understood this is dangerous. And I realized after that, I didn't have a sense of fear that was like hers, but it was there. It was just muted. And if I paid attention, I could always find it. After the break, Patrick tells me about one of the things that she used to do for fun. It is completely illegal, but for some reason she got away with it. I am very clear on who I am, which is a white woman of privilege. And I relied on that a lot. I was very aware that my circumstances would have been entirely different had I been a different race, gender, or had a different socioeconomic background. And we also talk about all the times that she's given into those dark urges. Stay with us. When did you start breaking into houses? How old were you and why that? I think it was probably opportunity. There was a house down the street from my grandmother's that was empty. And for me, that was opportunity. It was something I could do without drawing a lot of attention to myself. But I found that when I was in that house down the street from my grandmother's, I felt very much the same way that I did when I left the slumber party. I was 
so much at peace and I liked being alone. And I also liked the jolt of emotion or charge that I got from being someplace that I knew I wasn't quote unquote supposed to be. And again, this coping mechanism that I had sort of put together unconsciously became a lifestyle. As I got older, I started breaking into more houses and I started going into more places I wasn't quote unquote supposed to be. And it was always for the same reason. I liked that for once the exterior matched my interior climates in that it was static, it was quiet, it was blank, but it was also charged. There was something about that experience that was strangely comforting to me. It happened to be something that I could do as a kid that was easy and that I just perfected as I got older. What did you do inside the houses? Did you take things? Did you trash the joints? Never. I never took anything. That wasn't it for me. I always felt like a reverence for these places. I never wanted to hurt them or destroy them in any way. I simply wanted to exist in a place I knew I wasn't supposed to exist. I would read. I would take naps. <laughs> it sounds so strange because I understand that the neurotypical reaction to being in a house that you are not supposed to be in, there's going to be a lot of agitation. There's going to be a lot of nervousness. Yeah. Adrenaline. Yes. And it was the exact opposite for me. I felt so at peace and I would leave them exactly the way that I found them every time. Did you ever get caught? I remember one time leaving a house as someone was coming home. And I remember walking out the front door, walking towards the door and seeing the car in the driveway and thinking to myself, you're just going to walk out the door and walk down the steps and <laughs> they're not going to say a word. <laughs> like, And I've said this before. I remember when I was a kid, my father used to say, you can get anywhere in life with a confident walk and a walkie talkie. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I don't have the walkie talkie, but I'm going to walk out the front door of this house as if, what? Yeah. I'm supposed to be here. I had an appointment to be here. Yeah. These people who I can only assume are the homeowners, they watched me walk out of their house <laughs> and just <laughs> down the steps to my car and they didn't say anything. And I remember thinking, well, they're going to call the police. Yeah. And I just remember kind of like hanging out around the area, like to see, and they, I never saw a police car. I would love to know what they thought was going on. <laughs> Someone just walked out of their house. I know I'm not going to make you feel uncomfortable, so I'll just say you're incredibly beautiful and you are not what someone would think of, not just as a sociopath, but as someone who would be of any threat. You're conscious to say in your book that you are aware of the privilege of your appearance and your circumstance that gives you some impunity from some of the consequences of your actions. I think it gave me all the impunity from the consequences. I mean, I am very clear on who I am, which is a white woman of privilege. And I relied on that a lot. I was very aware that my circumstances would have been entirely different had I been a different race, gender, or had a different socioeconomic background. I understood it then and I understand it now which is not to say that I don't appreciate the compliments. Certainly I do, but that's exactly what was going through my head as I walked out the door. They're going to look at this woman leaving their house who is nicely dressed and not looking at them, not looking mm -hmm. nervous or guilty. It's going to be one of those like cognitive dissonance where you understand yeah. that something's off, but then you have an opposite set of facts that sort of, you know, it makes it harder for you to yeah. put all the weight on one scale. And I was just hopeful that if I put enough weight on this side of the scale, it would balance itself out. And it did. It seemed to have. Which made it easier for you to hide in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite facts about you is that as a kid, you had a ferret called baby, <laughs> which yeah. sent me on a, well, rabbit hole looking up <laughs> ferrets. And they're very, actually very cute. They are very cute. You loved Baby and you and Baby would go on adventures together and you would break into houses and you would hang out and Baby would play in the garden. And did you love Baby? I did love Baby and I'm grateful for that because 
again, having had the relationships that I had with my sister, with my mother, I had close relationships with them. I loved my sister, my mother, Mm. and I loved baby. So I was fortunate that I had those relationships. So I knew early that I was capable of love on that level. Maybe not as strongly as a neurotypical person, but it was proof. I can feel I have these feelings for these people and for this animal. And I, I did love baby. And you came home one day and your mom told you that baby had died. How did that feel? Matter of fact, it was something that I felt more cognitively than emotionally. I was sad that baby had died, but I wasn't emoting like my sister was. She was incredibly bereft. She cried for days. She had a very normal neurotypical experience to her grief or reaction to her grief. And I didn't have that. So I remember being in this really tricky spot where my mother was expecting a reaction from me that matched my sister's. And I had to choose. I could either fake it or be honest about the fact that I wasn't not feeling, I just wasn't feeling on the level that my sister seemed to have been. Your mom obviously picked up that there was something different about you. It alarmed her. It disturbed her. She freaked out that you weren't more upset about baby. And then she did something that made you very angry. She had a little funeral for baby and buried baby without you. How did that feel? I was so furious because it felt like a punishment. Which it kind of was. It was. My mom was angry at me for not feeling the way she thought I was supposed to feel, for not reacting the way she wanted me to feel. And her response was to punish me for it. And I remember feeling very angry, but also liberated again. In that anger, I also discovered when I am mad at you, my mother, I don't have to play by your rules. My mother served very much as an emotional compass for me. I would sort of turn to her for counsel on reactions to things and ways to negotiate being a low emotional kid in a high emotional world. But when my mom was angry, I lost access to that compass. But when I got angry, I didn't care about access to that compass. And I sort of felt a kernel of, wait, maybe I don't need this person to guide me. Maybe I can figure things out on my own. Because it was a very interesting relationship. She was almost like you say, your emotional compass and also a gatekeeper in that she wanted to keep you safe. She was very worried about you and perhaps your potential for doing things even worse than the ones or different to other kids than what she'd seen. So she would make you tell her. She would always call you my honest girl. And that was the highest praise you could get. So you really wanted her approval. You wanted to be her honest girl. And that sort of kept you on the straight and narrow. Is that sort of how it worked for a while? I felt like I needed her to believe that I was trying because I Mm -hmm. felt like as long as she believed that I was trying, she would continue to help me figure things out. So Mm -hmm. it was less approval and more necessity. I need this woman to keep me safe. I need this woman to help me figure out how to Mm. get through life with this very limited emotional understanding. Mm. And as I got older, I realized my mother and my sister both are very emotionally fluent. And there is only so much learning from them I could do because no amount of correction or understanding was never going to get me to their emotional level. So I had to sort of renegotiate that with myself. I needed to figure out how to keep myself safe. I needed to figure out how to make the right choices for myself because I had a different set of emotional needs than my mother and my sister did. So those early conflicts with my mom was really the gateway to that liberation of understanding this isn't fair to her and it's also not fair to me. This is not someone who's ever going to understand where I'm coming from. This is a a highway to disaster. One of the most dramatic incidents in your book and in your life involved a schoolmate of yours who was really annoying you. Can you describe that incident to me? 
I can. It's interesting that you set it up as such a turning point because I don't feel that way about it, but I understand why you do, why you would make that description. And I quote unquote, I should feel that way. This should be a real, you know, (laughs) on the map of my life, there should be a big red flag on this one. On this one, but there isn't for you, but for anyone reading the book and objectively, cognitively, you can see that wasn't a good day. It wasn't a great decision, but I remember feeling this pressure very early. And what I have now, you know, looking back piece together is that this tension that I was experiencing was a type of anxiety that was brought about not due to apathy, but by this understanding that if I didn't do something to fill the apathy with something that I was capable of really destructive acts. I was always concerned that I would get to a point of no return where I wouldn't be able to control myself, I think, as a kid. And so I would feel these compulsions to act out. And in a way, it was sort of like a pot that was boiling over and you turning down the heat a little bit. These early acts of deviance were my way of turning down the heat on the pot. I had been really struggling with this pressure and I had been acting out and doing these different destructive behaviors. Little things like stealing little things. Stealing little things, stealing backpacks. But again, I remember I didn't even want these things. It was the action of doing them that I wanted. It wasn't ever about that little kid has a toy I want and I'm going to take the toy. It was, if anything, I didn't want to do it, but I felt that I had no choice. But they hadn't been working. And I just felt this pressure growing and growing. And there was this schoolmate of mine who was standing next to me and she was truly just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I had a pencil and I stabbed her with it. And I remember the feeling was very much like popping a balloon and all of that pressure just went away. Again, I knew cognitively what I had done was wrong. I knew that I didn't want to hurt this child necessarily, but I also knew that doing it had resulted in not just a reduction in this pressure that I had been feeling, but it was almost this euphoric experience that I recognized as not great. I walked away. I felt very almost high. It was a conflicting feeling. So on one hand, I was so glad that the pressure was gone. But on the other hand, I also knew if this is where we're heading, I don't really know how I'm going to keep myself out of jail for the rest of my life. And that's where a lot of sociopaths end up, right? That's what the research indicates. The research indicates that sociopathy makes up just under 5% of the population. And that's a lot of people. But when you consider that most of the diagnostic interviews for sociopathy, secondary psychopathy, take place within the prison system, there's no way that that number isn't likely much higher. Because if they're doing all of these diagnostic interviews in the prison system, it's sort of like they're reverse engineering the diagnosis in a way where they're only testing these extreme versions of the sociopathic personality who have ended up in prison for doing Mm. bad things and demonstrating substantial amount of criminal versatility. The research also says that most of the individuals suffering from sociopathic personality disorder fall on the mild to moderate side. But because they're only diagnosing mostly within the prison system, most of the research is taken from that population, that sample, which is problematic. It's so funny hearing you tell that story. I mean, it's not funny, but it's interesting because there's no shame in your voice. There's not really any regret. It's just kind of like this thing happened and then I did this thing and here is how I felt. I'm imagining you sort of walking away from this crazy scene with this girl, there's blood spurting out of her neck, she's crying, everyone's freaking out. Is that what made you see that it wasn't the right thing to do? Or you did actually know that stabbing someone in the neck with a pencil wasn't the right thing to do? No, I knew cognitively. It's just that it's not connected to any emotion. Did you feel happy that she was crying? Like, did you worry that you were maybe a sadist and that you enjoyed other people's suffering? It wasn't ever bloodlust for me. I never got off on hurting others. It was always behavior driven by a compulsion that I didn't really understand. Yeah. And again, had I not been standing next to her, I would have done something else. I don't know what else I would have done. It was just one of those things where I didn't really think about it. And you're right. I have cognitive shame. Obviously, I understand 
that wasn't great. I didn't want to hurt this kid. I didn't want that to be her experience. But at the same time, I wasn't driven by malice, which doesn't excuse it. There is a difference there. And that's why I wrote the book is sociopathy has become synonymous with evil. And I understand that. I mean, I want to be very clear. My intention here is not to minimize sociopathy. There are individuals with sociopathic personality disorder who are dangerous and who do dangerous things and don't learn from their mistakes. There are individuals on the extreme side of the spectrum for whom rehabilitation is not possible. Mm. But what I'm trying to get people to understand is those examples only make up a very small part of the equation. Yeah. The research indicates that sociopathy is treatable, particularly when those treatments are started early. And I want a parent who, if they recognize their child in the pages of my book, won't feel helpless, will understand this is not a lost cause. Mm. Your child is not someone that that needs to be locked up and Mm. forgotten about. There are options, but I think as long as we're only focusing on the extreme examples, when you're dealing with cancer, there are extreme stages of cancer, but there are also stages that are treatable, early stages. But if yeah. all we ever did was focus on the terminal stages of cancer, we would never find a cure for it because we would never be focusing on stages one, two, three. It would only be those advanced stages. Same can be said of sociopathy. If we're only focusing on these extreme examples for whom rehabilitation is not an option, then we're never going to get to you know the treatment options and the research for people who are able to be treated and who are receptive to self-awareness. After this break, it gets a little bit dark. There was definite dissociation at play because I understood what I was doing was not something that I wanted to do, but I also knew that it was going to reduce this pressure that I'd been feeling. And I also asked Patrick what it's like being friends with a sociopath like her. I'm happy to problem solve. I'm happy to listen and help you navigate a problem. But I'm not the person to come to if you're struggling with guilt, only because I can't relate to it. So my advice is always going to be stop. We'll be right back. The other incident that stood out is another outlier in your life, but one that other people who hearing that you're a sociopath might think is very common is when you hurt a cat. Well, you didn't hurt the cat. You nearly hurt the cat. If you can just explain that. And was that another situation where the pressure was building? How old were you? Maybe 13, 12, 13. Mm. The pressure had been building. We were visiting my great grandmother in Virginia and I'd been feeling very antsy for a few days. And I just remember seeing this cat and grabbing it and just squeezing it and squeezing it. And there was definite dissociation at play because I understood what I was doing was not something that I wanted to do, but I also knew that it was going to reduce this pressure that I'd been feeling. And I am very grateful that I released the cat before it was seriously injured I would disagree with you. You know, you say you almost hurt the cat. I think I probably did hurt the cat. I don't think the cat enjoyed that experience. I certainly didn't break any of its bones. That cat probably felt a tremendous amount of terror and fear. I was squeezing it to death. It didn't die. I let it go and it ran away. But I remember having that feeling sort of out of body experience, brain experience, where I was like, I know that this is wrong, but I also know that I don't have an emotional connection to the wrongness of it. So I'm Mm -hmm. going to have to start being very hyper aware of this pressure. I'm going to have to be more mindful and get on top of it because I don't want things like that to keep happening. And it was selfishly driven because I also understood if you go around killing animals and stabbing kids, <laughs> that's going to catch up to you. I understood the perks of society. I understood the perks of friends and family. And I also understood that continuing to do things like that was a threat to that desire. Yeah. I don't want to give myself more credit than I deserve. Mm. This was a selfish decision. Mm. And from that point on, I really, I tried to get ahead of the pressure so that it wouldn't get to a point where I was feeling like I couldn't control myself and doing things that I knew I didn't want to do. What's so fascinating is that the burden of not feeling anything could only be relieved by doing something bad. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily by doing just something risky. It had to be bad. It had to be socially unacceptable. So you couldn't just like 
bungee jump or right. do something difficult. You, you had to actually do something bad. So you wrote this prescription for yourself. What did it involve? I'd been doing a lot of research and I read a study about the effects of anxiety and sociopathy. And what I sort of started to understand was that the apathy wasn't driving this pressure I was feeling. It was my reaction to this apathy, this feeling of I'm starting to feel nothing. And if I don't do something about it, I'm going to end up losing control of myself. It was an irrational belief system that I eventually challenged and overcame. But at the time, I remember thinking, I'm experiencing this reaction to my apathy. I'm not at a place yet where I can accept it or just experience it without this anxiety. This anxiety is driving me to do destructive things. So rather than wait for that anxiety to rise, I thought I would be proactive and start taking on smaller, more regular acts of transgression, as opposed to waiting for that destructive behavior compulsion to get overwhelming. So I put myself on a trouble schedule where I would break into a house or steal a car or follow someone around. And I would do it regularly, whether I was feeling the pressure or not. It was like a preemptive like maintenance. Yep. And it worked. I, I noticed that as long as I was engaging in these smaller acts of deviance, those larger compulsive urges were few and far between. Why did that stop working? It's less that it stopped working and more that I had to have another conversation with myself similar to the one I had as a kid when I was thinking about how to manage myself and how I could integrate into society. I understood that I wanted relationships. I wanted a real relationship and a real job. And I wanted a life where I wasn't faking it all the time. But I also understood that in order to have those things, you can't be running out and breaking into houses and following people and stealing cars unless you're with someone else who's like you. And I don't know that that's what I wanted either. I knew that in order to have an honest relationship, I would have to be honest with myself first and foremost, and then with the person that I was in partnership mm. with. So I had to come up with something else. I imagine also that it affects the people that you tell in different ways. Like I had a compulsion not a compulsion, but well, maybe a compulsion to like confess things to you because I knew you wouldn't judge me. Did you find that that's something that happened to you? I know you were talking to a guy at a party once and had a pretty disturbing conversation. I did. And that was fairly recently. I have always found that the more I am upfront about my shallow emotional affect, my reduced sense of fear, mm. the things that I've done, exactly what you just said. People feel comfortable because they know they're not going to be judged. So they open up to you nine times out of 10. The things that people share with me are liberating for them and entertaining for me. In the case of this guy, he was talking about wanting to kill his wife. And I just remember thinking, keep him talking. I want to know everything about this woman. I want to know everything about this man. I want to know where he lives. I want to know if they have kids. And so I really leaned into his darkness to get all these details so that later I could report him and do everything I could to make sure that he didn't act on these things that he was telling me. How's friendship challenging as a sociopath? I think that as long as the person that I am in a friendship with understands where I'm coming from, it's not challenging at all. It's less challenging for me than it is for them. If you and I were friends, what would it be like for you? What would it be like for me that's different to my other friendships? I find neurotypical individuals really interesting. So I like hearing your stories. I like hearing your struggles. My internal world is black and white. Yours is full of color. And I like being in that colorful world. I don't know that I want to live there. Speak to that for a second. Your internal world is black and white. What do you mean by that? Most of my decisions are based on logic, not emotion. Because I don't have those constructs like guilt and shame sort of forcing my hand, I have to rely on external philosophies. I think that's why Buddhism appealed to me very early on. Buddhism is a religion that isn't ruled by shame or oughts or shoulds. It's very logical. It's cause and effect. And that's what my internal world looks like. I'm not thinking about disappointing someone or my decisions aren't made as a result of people pleasing. I don't react to guilt or shame. So it's very cut and dry with me. Whereas the nuance of emotion, there are so many different hues and so many different 
extremes. And I am endlessly interested in that world. Is that why so much of what you used to do as a kid and as a young adult, that stalking behavior that you talk about, following people, looking through windows, going into their houses, what do you think that was about now that you're older and you look back on it? I really think that it was the equivalent of pressing your nose up against department store glass. I was so interested in these worlds and I was so interested in these emotions and these reactions, but I also knew you can't just stare at people all day. You can't just walk around (laughs) as much as I would love to, but that's what I got to do. When I was looking through someone's windows, I could make a bowl of popcorn and sit in someone's backyard all night, just watching all the things that are going on. And I understand that that's not a... (laughs) It's not exactly a comforting feeling to think that I might be sitting in your backyard, but (laughs) you didn't want to hurt me. You weren't obsessed with me. You didn't, you were just interested in me, like going to the zoo or watching a documentary. Completely. And I truly believe that that's why I enjoy reality television so much. It's that equivalent, except now I don't have to leave my house. I can just turn on the television and watch these people interact in their environments. Certainly it's sensationalized. I mean, these aren't always normal environments that you're watching, but I will watch people living their lives and just sort of objectively looking at their emotional choices. And I find it so Fascinating. fascinating. So to your original question, what would it be like for you? I think it's all about boundaries. You know, as your friend, I would say, or you would glean after a while, I'm happy to problem solve. I'm happy to listen and help you navigate a problem, but I'm not the person to come to if you're struggling with guilt. I'm not the person to come to if you're struggling with people pleasing only because I can't relate to it. So my advice is always going to be stop, you know, (laughs) (laughs) or just do it. If you want to do it, just do it. So I think my friends know the problems to come to me with, you know, but you do care about your friends. I do. I do. I care about them a great deal. I don't need them. And that Mm. sounds cold, maybe. You don't need a lot of dietary variety. We choose to eat and indulge in all kinds of things because we like it, because it tastes good, because we love the Mm. ceremony of sitting down to a beautiful table and the different utensils and the different glasses of wine. We don't need those things. We love those things. We enjoy those things. And I think of it similarly. I love setting a beautiful table. Can I eat on a dining room table with one fork and plate? Sure. Mm. But I prefer to have a lovely table, just like I prefer to have these people in my life. They bring such color and nuance to my life. And I I suspect I bring something to their life as well. I don't have that many friends. But that additive to your life, you wouldn't feel depleted if they weren't there, but they add something of value. Mm Mm-hmm. When you were talking about looking through people's windows and watching reality TV, being a therapist is exactly like that, right? Like I get to indulge my inappropriate curiosity by asking, you know, doing this show and and asking people questions, intrusive questions. You get to do it by being a therapist. How did you become a therapist? I did not want to do it at all. I had to fulfill a clinical requirement as part of my master's and then subsequently part of my PhD requirement was logging these hours. I tried every possible way to get out of it. I had no interest in being a therapist. I thought the idea sounded like a hellscape. Why did you think that? Did you think you needed to be empathetic? Yes. And also I don't care about these people. Like (laughs) I don't know these people. So you're just going to sit them down in front of me and they're just going to start talking and I'm supposed to give a shit and I'm supposed to diagnose and like treat and help. Like this is a bad idea. But Patrick, you're so interested in people. You sit in their gardens and look at them through their windows. Like this is perfect. Interact with them. (laughs) Ah, Nothing's required of you in that situation. Correct. But what I figured out is that nothing is required of a therapist other than observation. It's so true. Once I understood that, once I understood that I could just be objective, this wasn't about me and Patrick helping these people. This was about applying my experience, certainly, but also the things that I learned. You know, when I went to get my PhD, I wanted to learn more about sociopathy, crazily. It didn't occur to me that I would also have to learn about other personality types as well. But once I did, I started to understand 
my own personality type within the context of these others, how there's so much similarity, how there's so much overlap. And it really informed my experience of the human condition. I really enjoyed working as a therapist so much more than I ever thought that I would. I ended up blowing far past the requirements needed for my PhD, logging hour after hour after hour. And it was only when we decided to expand our family that I realized this isn't something that I can do forever. But I was pleasantly surprised at how much I enjoyed it and that I was relatively decent at it. Mm. And I think that my lack of emotion played a part in that, in that I wasn't coming to these individuals with my own set of emotional baggage. If anything, it was the opposite. And I think that that allowed me to be more observant. I never felt triggered by the things that they said. They never had to worry about protecting my emotional well-being, Mm -hmm. their confessions or their feelings about me. If someone's been listening to this and thinking, oh, that sounds like me, that sounds like my child, that sounds like my parents, someone I know, the first thing I would do is urge them to read your book, which is just so good. Thank you. What's the second thing they should do? So much of sociopathy, so many of the descriptors, they're all behavior. And certainly that's true. There are a lot of destructive behaviors associated with sociopathy. But really, The crux of of sociopathy is limited access to the social emotions. If you are somebody that experiences that, does it make you a bad person? You know, there's nothing inherently immoral about having limited access to emotion. It's not how or what we feel, it's what we do. And I think that understanding that for myself is what really helped kickstart my growth, knowing, okay, so I can't do anything about the way that I feel, but what I can do is start working on the things that I'm doing as a result of that apathy. That normalization, as crazy as it sounds, was half the battle. Okay, I'm not a terrible person. I'm not a foregone conclusion. And as a kid, everything I ever heard about sociopathy was serial killers and monsters. And I remember as I started to really see myself in the description, the diagnostic description, I remember thinking, I don't feel like a monster. I don't feel like a serial killer. But then I also remember thinking, is this something that just happens? Like, am I just going to wake up one morning and kill somebody? Because that's what happens when you are like me. And once I understood, actually, no, that's not what happens. It was so, such a relief. And that's what I'm hoping that anyone listening to this who hears themselves in my description or sees their personality in mine you're not a lost cause. You're more than your personality type. You're more than your behavior. For parents of children who see their kids in my personality type, one of the first things I would do if I was a parent of a neurodivergent child is I would sit that kid down and have them watch Wednesday on Netflix. Because if you look at the Wednesday character, this is a child who meets nearly all of the sociopathic diagnostics. And yet we root for her. Why? Because she's capable of forming Mm. bonds. She's capable of caring for her pet. She grieves that pet when it passes. She has a complicated relationship with connecting to others, but she figures it out. She's loyal. She's a good friend. She's a role model. Yeah. It sounds overly simplistic, but I think that showing a neurodivergent child that program would allow that child to see themselves. To feel seen. Yeah represented by somebody that's not an ax murderer or, yeah, you know. Because kids know, right? They know that they're different. I think that's why I liked Blondie so much as a kid, because even though I didn't know her or I couldn't see her, her attitude was projected. Yeah. Made me feel represented beyond these one dimensional, you know, monstrous examples. Mm. I sort of filled in the blanks with Blondie, but Kids these days don't have to fill in the blanks. There's an entire series dedicated to a neurodivergent child. It has very low emotional affect. That was not the end of our conversation. Oh, no. We have talked about being friends with a sociopath. But what about romantic relationships? What are they like? In a way, I was very complicit in what later became our biggest issue in that by devising that plan, I was essentially making him my priest in a way. This is somebody I 
to confess to. Unconsciously, I was making him responsible for me. And we also talk about cheating and whether she cheats, why she cheats or doesn't cheat. Plus, what happened when she became a mother? What does a sociopathic mother look like? I was really angry because a part of me had been holding out hope. This is going to be the time where I'm, for once, I'm going to have that same emotional experience that everybody else has. To listen, just click the link in the show notes. And we'll also put a link to Patrick's wonderful book, Sociopath. Also, we have a special little capsule mini series on No Filter at the moment. It's called The Secret Lives of Olympians and Paralympians. It's guest hosted by Olympic gold medalist Libby Trickett, who is a hoot. And so far, she's interviewed Paralympic sprinter and long jumper Vanessa Lowe and Matilda's star midfielder Katrina Gorey. And there's one more, but it's a surprise. The executive producer of No Filter is Kimberly Bradish with sound production by Leah Porges and I'm Mia Friedman. And thank you for having me in your ears. <laughs> <laughs>